Now allow me to ask you a question. How many of you here would consider yourselves procrastinators? How many of you here would consider your, oh, 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 all right. That's a strong percentage. Um, at least now I want you, you're above average. <laughs> I knew you were above average. Now I really know that. And nationally, uh, 26% of Americans consider themselves procrastinators today. That's quite a jump from the late 70s. The percentage was actually 5% of Americans considered themselves procrastinators. And what is the big reason? The big reason is distractions. We have so many more distractions around us today, whether it's things like Netflix and Hulu, Disney Plus, which is worth every penny, by the way, so I may not pick on that one too much, but many other things that distract us and games and all types of things that keep us from taking a step and doing the things that we know that we need to do. You might say that often for many of us, we have a conviction that there is something that we need to do. We have a knowledge that there's something that we need to do. We have a belief that there's something in something and what that belief ought to lead to us to do action-wise. But for whatever reason, we just haven't been able to take that leap, to take that step to do that thing. And for many people, through stories that I've had with some of you and others, often that step is baptism. Often people know what they need to do. They have the right beliefs, but for one reason or another, they just haven't quite taken that step to be baptized. Now, what's interesting in the New Testament, specifically the book of Acts, is that's something that we don't see. There isn't any procrastination when it comes to the early believers. That the moment that they believed, immediately after that, they took, their, they took that step to be baptized. As examples here, in Acts chapter 2, the crowd in Jerusalem at Pentecost, after Peter preached, 3,000 plus of them were baptized. Simon the magician and the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts chapter 8, once they believed after that, then they were baptized. Actually, Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch, the Ethiopian eunuch, he asked this question as they were riding in the chariot, as Philip was explaining the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ to him, he says, look, there's water. They were coming up on a body of water and he says, why shouldn't I be baptized? It's really more of a, what you might say, a rhetorical question. It's kind of question. It's not so much a question. It's really more of a statement. It's like when my wife says to me, when are you going to put your clothes away? It's not really a question. It's really more of a statement. When are you going to pick up your shoes? Not a question. It's a statement. So the Ethiopian eunuch says, why shouldn't I be baptized? And they got down out of the chariot and immediately they were baptized. The apostle Paul in Acts chapter 9, he encounters Jesus on the road to Damascus. He is blinded for three days. And then after three days of prayer and reflection, he seemingly comes to a belief in Jesus. Ananias, this man, comes to see him. And seeing that Paul believes, he says, Paul, get up. What are you waiting for? Be baptized. And maybe that's a question I have for you today. What are you waiting for? And then the Philippian jailer in Acts 16, once he believed, baptism followed. But there are many barriers for many of us. There are these things that often get in the way of us taking that step that cause us to procrastinate. Sometimes it's distractions. In this particular case, it's often other things. Things like a fear of water. It's a small percentage of people, but genuinely people have a fear of water. They don't like going under water. And, and I'll just tell you on the front end here, I've been baptizing people for 15 plus years and I've only lost six people. So I'm kidding. I haven't lost anyone yet. I promise you, we'll be able to get you out of the water and I won't even be the only one in there. There's multiple people in there to get you out. You don't have anything to worry about. That water is only three feet deep. There's a fear of backsliding. Because there are things that we do that we wish we wouldn't do. There's things we say that we wish we wouldn't say. There's things that we think that we wish we would stop thinking. There's addictions that consume us. There's behaviors that we wish would fall by the wayside, but for one reason or another, they stick with us. And then we want to finally change. We want to get serious about Jesus, but we don't take that step because we're worried about becoming a hypocrite, right? And maybe if you've said that, I just want to say this to you. You're going to be a hypocrite no matter what. <laughs> the only difference is, will you be a forgiven one or an unforgiven one? Are you going to be the kind of person that when you make the mistake, there's grace and compassion and mercy waiting for you? Or are you going to be the kind of person that's always stuck trying to get even with God again? By even, I mean try to earn your right standing with him again. 
You can't let a fear of what you might do keep you from doing what it is that you know you need to do. Just because there are things that you shouldn't have done doesn't mean that you, it should, those things should keep you from doing the thing that you know that you, sh- that you should do, that you need to do, that you have to do, that you believe in doing. Don't let the fear of backsliding keep you from doing what it is that you know that you need to do, the right thing now. As those right decisions, catch this, they compound on one another. They build on one another. They build and build and build and build. And as you build up these right decisions that you've made in the Lord, gradually what happens is you get further and further away from the wrong decisions that you don't want to make right now. You get to a point where you really, it's hard to go back to those decisions ever again. There's also a fear of disrespect because you came up in a family in which your family dedicated you to the Lord as a child. And they brought you before a priest or, or some other type of pastor at a church. And, and uh, the clergy member sprinkled water on you. And in that moment, your parents were seemingly dedicating you to the Lord and saying, we are going to do everything that we can to raise this child up in the Lord. They were saying, God, we want you to bless this child. God, we want... One day when this child becomes older, for this little boy or this little girl to walk in your footsteps. And so for many of us, we feel like we're turning our bags backs on that particular moment when we maybe take a step to be immersed, to be baptized. And our understanding isn't that. And in no way would we ever want to be disrespectful, dis, dismissing, disregard what it was that was started so many years ago. Instead, the way that we view this is, this step in which you take to be baptized, in which you make the decision to be baptized, isn't something that disregards what has happened so many years ago. Instead, it is a fulfillment of what happened so many years ago, that they started this thing, and now you get to bring it into consummation in which you get to make that decision to be baptized for your, for yourself. And then there is a general misunderstanding often. Should I do it? Do I have to do it? Do I need to manifest spiritual gifts? We start to ask these different types of questions, and we don't always understand baptism properly. I mean, some people even associate baptism with being a Baptist, and that's just not the case at all. We're, not a, we're a non-denominational church. Baptism doesn't have anything to do with necessarily being Baptist. Baptism has to do with being biblical, and that's what we are trying to do here. And so there are these, often these barriers that get in the way of us being baptized. So why should you be baptized? Well, I'm going to give you three reasons. There are many reasons. I can go on and on and on. I could probably talk for a few hours about this subject, but we only have a few minutes. And so if you're somebody who is asking questions, or maybe you're someone who is considering taking that step today, why should you be baptized? Well, the first reason that you should be is to express your faith. It's been said that an impression without an expression leads to depression. That when something is impressed deep upon us, some type of emotion often elicits laughter, it elicits tears, things along those lines. When there is this impression, this activity, there needs to be an expression that follows. That's why in the, in the New Testament, when Jesus was healing somebody, he often called for a response. He could have healed them right there, right then. He could have given them sight. He could have cl- cleansed, that, um, cleansed that withered hand, made it strong and firm, a firm handshake out of that hand again. He could have done those things, but often he would challenge them to express their faith. Just as some examples, in John 9, Jesus said to the blind man, go wash in the pool of Siloam. Now, why would he need to do that? Because he wanted him to express his faith. Luke 6, Jesus, Jesus told a man with a withered hand, stretch forth that hand. He didn't have to stretch it forth. Jesus could have just touched it. But he's asking for an expression of faith. Luke 17, Jesus told the ten lepers, go show yourself to the priest. That when there was something happening to them, Jesus often asked for a response. A public display of what was going on. And that's what happened in Acts chapter two. As Peter was preaching, preaching who Jesus was in Acts chapter two, one of the most phenomenal sermons ever. Really, if you read it, it's probably one of the most boring sermons ever, but it gets a great response. And that's often what happens when God's word is spoken, when God is speaking through someone. 
It doesn't matter how engaging or dynamic the word is. There's still an incredible response because his word doesn't return void. At the climax of Peter's sermon, he says these words, Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. When the people heard of this, they were cut to the heart. There was an impression inside of them. And said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter didn't say, go home. Peter didn't say, pray. Peter didn't say, read scriptures. Peter didn't say, go do a service project. All good things to do. But when there was this impression, he said, it's time for you to repent, to change your thinking, to change your living, to get on a different path. And that starts with being baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That when they were cut to the hearts in this way, there was an expression of that. Now, how should you be baptized? Well, the Greek word that is used here is a Greek word known as baptizo. It literally means to immerse. The Greek word for sprinkle is harantizo, which means sprinkle. Now, if you go back to the text, and I won't take you quite back to it, this is the Greek word that is used there. Our church comes from a movement that is known as the Restoration Church Movement. It happened hundreds of years ago out of Kentucky. The heartbeat of this particular movement was to get back to the original church, to get back to the first century church and to live out what it is that that church lived out in a very reasonable way. Reasonable, I emphasize that word, because they read from scrolls, and and, you know, that's not reasonable. So we, we have a different text that we work off of. But what is reasonable is baptism. And as they were trying to restore the early church and that, that movement that was Christianity in the first century, they wanted to follow in the footsteps of those people that started that church. And the way they baptized was through immersion. And so they used the word here, baptizo. And so with that, as a church, that's why us as a church, we function with this particular practice of baptism. Some churches don't do that, and that's, that's okay. That's, that's their decision. But our understanding of the scriptures and what it is that our purpose is and our movement is about, we're non-denominational, but we still come out of that movement that we want everyone to be baptized the same way. There's too many different understandings of baptism. Coming back to spiritual gifts and if I should have to do it or I don't have to do it and when should I do it and how should I do it. it and it affects other things in the church too when you have these different understandings of this subject. And so we said there is one way that we are going to do it. And we actually say that if you want to be in a member of this church, that that is how we want you to do it. That we want you to be immersed And it comes back to these particular roots. Another reason to be baptized is to to benchmark your commitment. To benchmark your commitment. You know, let let me ask some of you a slightly personal question. What's your worst sin? Just kidding. No. (laughs) How many of you have grown up in the church? How many of you grew up? I mean, some of you, oh man, that's awesome. So many of you. you. I know you praise God for your heritage. I know you do. I know you do. Two things. One is God doesn't have grandchildren. God doesn't have great-grandchildren. You know what I'm saying, right? You can't live off of your grandmother's faith. You can't live off of your mother's faith or your father's faith. There comes a point in which you have to be a child of God, in which you have to benchmark that commitment. The second thing I would say to those of you that have grown up in church, but it's really just making a point for all of us, is that often as I've had conversations with, with you, is that you don't really know when that moment was that you really placed your faith in Jesus Christ, which you would look back and say you were saved because it's just a part, it's always been a part of who you are. It's always been a part of your life. And so you think like, well, there was this time I read some scripture, there was this other time I said a prayer, and this other time I raised my hand, maybe this other time I came forward and I knelt. And it's just hard to pinpoint that moment. But what I've found again and again and again and again with people is that without even thinking about it, But then there was that day when I was baptized. It's just intrinsic in us, spiritually speaking, that that becomes the natural moment when we benchmark our commitment to follow Jesus. When we are made new. Romans chapter 6, verse 3 and 4 says, Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? 
We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead, through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. The old is gone and the new has come. The motion of baptism is simply us placing our hands in someone else who has been baptized themselves. This visualizes, this symbolizes death into the water is burial. Out of the water is a resurrection into a new life in which you follow Jesus. The third reason for us to be baptized is to identify with Christ. Did you know that Jesus was baptized? Of all people, how is it that Jesus was baptized? Why is it that he needed to be baptized? In Matthew chapter 3, it says, Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John, John the Baptist. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? Jesus replied, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this, to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. Uh, As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. Did Jesus need to be cleansed of his sins? Did Jesus finally need to have faith that he was the son of God? No. Why was it that Jesus was baptized? to set an example for each and every one of us. And I know there's even some of you now that are, as you're following in the footsteps of Jesus, that you are even wanting to set an example for children of yours. We baptized one of those families earlier today. They just want to set a good example to express the faith that they have in Jesus. And so with that, Jesus was baptized. And John says this, whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus walked. And Jesus walked in many ways, but one of them was to a river to be baptized. It's been said that Jesus walked 40 or 60 miles to be baptized. Won't some of you walk 40 or 60 feet to make that same decision? When I, about 16 years ago, right about the time I became a Christian, I sat, or at the time I, at the time I made a confession of faith. I was sitting in a pastor's office. He was talking with me. He was explaining to me what it meant to be a follower of Jesus and how I need to be cleansed of my sins. And at that moment, he asked me to pray with him and a prayer to ask God to save me. And I said that prayer. And then I opened my eyes and he opened his eyes and he was crying and I had no idea what was going on. But I knew it was a meaningful moment. The first thing that he said to me, do you know what he said to me? Phil, you need to be baptized. At that particular church, we didn't have a baptistry. We're fortunate that we have one as nice as this one. It's like a hot tub. <laughs> we is, we're fortunate to have one like this. I have friends of mine who have churches. They don't have a baptistry, but we're fortunate that we have this one. As soon as I had an opportunity to get baptized, I scheduled it. I went to the church. I was in a church service similar to this one. I have no idea what, was, I have no idea what exactly I said in the baptistry. I have no idea who was even in the congregation that day. The only thing that I remember happening was coming up out of that water. It was truly something new that was taking place. Something I would even say that was supernatural. When Jesus was baptized, it's been said that the heavens opened up. Now, I don't know if heaven opened up when I was baptized, but I know for certain that hell closed up. Today is February the 2nd. And maybe you woke up today thinking that this would be like any other Sunday. Maybe at the very least you just thought it'd be like any other day. Completely unremarkable. But maybe something's been stirring inside of you. Maybe you feel like God has been speaking to you. Maybe you feel like God has been leading you to make this decision today to be baptized, to walk forward, to make that decision, to live a new life, to be made new. And if that's you, we're going to give you, a, give you an opportunity in a few moments to respond to an invitation to be baptized.